Hi everyone, my name is Brooke and I'm a geologist and I'm here on the beautiful island of Iron to look at some of the exciting geology here. Today we're going to be looking at the sedimentary sequence that's along the Corrie Shore over there. And that's a range of beautifully preserved sediments that go from the Upper Devonian all the way through to the Permian. We've got a range of really cool paleo environments, some really good environmental changes, fantastic sedimentary structures. So let's go and have a look. Geology is really cool. Let's go lick some rocks. For those of you who aren't familiar with the British Isles, here's the Isle of Arran on the southeast coast of Scotland and we've driven all the way from Oxford. The geology of Arran is quite diverse considering it's such a tiny wee little island. We're going to look at all of these different types of rocks starting today on the northeast corner in the area known as Corrie Shaw. So let's go and have a look. So here's our first stop. We're going to look at the old red sandstone, most of which is Devonian in age. So that means it's between, say, 420 and then 360 million years old. And during this time, the southern parts of the UK, which are part of a little continent called Avalonia, along with parts of Newfoundland, collided with the northern continent of Laurentia, which was North America, Greenland and parts of the northern British Isles. And that closed the Iapis Ocean and built a mountain range called the Caledonian Mountains. And it's the erosion of the Caledonian Mountains that produced this old red sandstone. And because of that, LaRouche is also sometimes known as the old red continent. But what kind of environment was it deposited in and why is it red? Let's take a closer look. We can see here, mixed in with all of the red sand, that there's these big lumps, these pebbles. And that means that this type of sandstone is called a conglomerate. And there's a few different kinds of pebbles in here. We've got these white milky vein quartz pebbles. We've got bits of metamorphic rock called schist and quartzite. And then we've also got these lumps of red sandstone. So we know that the sandstone was actually eroding itself as it was depositing itself. The size of the grains in a clastic rock are usually related to the depositional environment's energy. And it must have been in a pretty high energy wet environment because you would need water to push these rocks around. And in this outcrop a little bit further down the beach we can see plentiful evidence for the action of water. We can actually see how these coarse conglomerate sandstones have cut down through and into these softer fine grained sandstones forming little channels. And that's a telltale sign that we're dealing with an ancient river system. These blotchy patches here are the remains of ancient roots and ancient burrows. They would have been full of organic matter and that's caused chemical reduction. And these are desiccation cracks and they form on the Earth's surface when wet sediment dries out under hot sun. So it was a pretty arid environment and that's why the sandstone's red, because air can get between the grains and oxidise any iron. Here we can see how these cross-bedded coarse sandstones are digging down into the fine-grained muddy sandstones that have all the roots in as well. So this is the base of our channel where it's cut into an adjacent floodplain or overbank deposit next to the main river channel. And look how it weathers differently from the finer sandstone. It's got no clay in it because it was deposited in flowing water and the clay got carried away. Not all the coarse sandstones have conglomerate in them though, and that means that these conglomerate depositing high energy events were probably something relatively rarer. So they might represent events like flash flooding, and seasonal flash flooding is really common in modern arid environments today. So if you think about places like Oman, or southwest United States, or southern Africa. So that basically means back in the day, Arran was a river dominated desert. As we walk south along the beach, the rocks get younger. So we've now passed from the late Devonian and we've gone into the Carboniferous between 300 and 360 million years ago. And we can see now that we've got a very different kind of rock. For a start, it's black, and instead of being granular, it's full of these pale crystals and all of these little holes that make it look foamy. And those pale tabular, milky white crystals are our old friend Plagioclase feldspar. And if you get up close and personal to this rock, you can actually see it's also got little tiny weathered pyroxenes in it, occasionally olivines. And that combination of minerals tells us that we've got a basalt, the second most boring rock on earth. Though I promise you this is actually quite exciting for a basalt. So this rock's an agglomerate. It got erupted onto the surface as basalt, but then reworked by sedimentary processes and mixed in with the sand, probably while some of it was still quite hot and gooey. So that's pretty interesting, eh? A crystalline igneous rock behaving like a sediment and being shaped by sedimentary processes on the surface. Before we move on to more rocks, here's some of the fantastic wildlife you see on Aaron sometimes. 
So in the distance there, those splashing shapes are actually a little pod of dolphins. They swam down the shore and then turned around and came back to have a look at us, probably wondering why we're messing around with rocks and not hunting squid and fish. It's not exactly Blue Planet quality footage, but you know, what you want for free with a smartphone? <laughs> so, some modern vertebrates, or you could think of them as future phosphatic bioclasts. <laughs> Now we've gone south along the coast and further along in the stratigraphy and we're still in the Carboniferous but now we're in a different environment from our volcanic environment. So we've got this limestone now and you can see all these nobbles on the roof and this is the underside of the seabed and those are huge shells from a creature called a brachiopod and this brachiopod's called Gigantoproductus. Brachiopods look like clams and bivalves, which are a type of mollusk related to snails, but brachiopods are something different. They're a filter feeding organism that has a specialist structure, it's unique, and it's called a lophophore, kind of like a brush that they use to filter particles out of the water. And as you can see, brachiopods used to be really common back in the Paleozoic, and they're still around today, but they're nowhere near as common. Do you think if it could talk, this woodlouse would have a Scottish accent like, Hello there, have you got any dead plant matter? I'm peckish. What do the brachiopods and limestones tell us about the environment? Limestones form in tropical environments around the equator today, and there's a lot of geological evidence to show that during the Carboniferous, the UK was mostly at the equator and in the tropics. It's where all the coal forests came from, and it also means either the land has gone down, or the sea level has gone up, or some combination of the two. But we can't always tell which process is dominant at a given time and at what scale. So now we've gone into younger rocks stratigraphically directly on top of the limestones, and we can see we've got more red beds here. And that means we've gone into a terrestrial or near shore environment. We've got red sandstones and red mudstones, but we don't have any of those coarse grained sandstones or red conglomerates. So we're in a relatively lower energy environment than the arid uplands where the conglomerates were deposited. And the fact we've got terrestrial sediments directly on top of marine sediments means we've got rapid relative sea level rise. It's more likely to be driven by local subsidence and uplift of the land rather than global sea level changes. And we've definitely got shallow water deposits here because look at these lovely wave ripples that are preserved in the rocks. We can see that they're wave ripples because they're mostly symmetrical but there are some asymmetrical current formed ripples here so we've got an interaction of currents and waves and that's exactly the kind of thing you'd expect to see in a shallow near shore environment. What's probably happening here is that the land's gone down and been drowned and that's when we've had our limestone deposited and then slowly the sea has filled up with sediment and we've had a delta prograding out because remember we've still got those big rivers coming down from the Caledonian mountains dumping sediment. It's just now we're at the coastal end of the river system and not at the upland end as we were in the Devonian. And a modern equivalent of this would be somewhere like the Mississippi Delta, where you've got this interplay between sedimentation, local subsidence and uplift rates, and then absolute changes in sea level due to things like ice age glaciations. Back on the beach again, higher up in the stratigraphy now in the late Carboniferous, and we've got these really weird sandstones. So let's have a look at them. You've probably already noticed then that the bedding is all contorted and convoluted and we can see that that convoluted texture is overprinting original sedimentary structures like cross bedding and then the original lamination and bedding that would have happened when the sediment was deposited. So that means that these convolutions have happened after the sediment was deposited. We know that rocks can get deformed by metamorphic and tectonic processes, but because the rocks above and below aren't metamorphosed or tectonized, we know that this is something that's only happened to this specific unit of rock. And those little flame structures there give us a clue because they form when water escapes from a sediment that's starting to be put under pressure. And that can come from rapidly piling up more sediment on top of it, or from something like an earthquake. And we can see a really beautiful example here on the left of a water escape structure so we know that we've got lots of water shooting up out of the sediments into overlying layers and convoluting and twisting all of those sedimentary layers that had already formed. We can't say for certain if it was from sedimentary loading or from ancient earthquakes. Both are equally likely. We know we're at the end of a delta where sediments will be piling up really really quickly on the seafloor and they'll be slumping but we also know the basin was tectonically active at this time, so both are equally likely. Now we're leaving the Carboniferous behind and we're going into the Permian period, and you can see straight away there's a big contrast between the sediments, firstly in the colour, and secondly in the kind of structures that you see in them. We're probably pretty comfortable at this point in saying that red and orange sandstones are terrestrial sediments that were formed in arid environments. And we've seen plenty of cross bedding and we know that that's from sediment deposited by fluid flow. And previously the cross beds we've seen were deposited by water, but water is not the only fluid on the Earth's surface. Air is a fluid as well. And that's because fluidity is a behaviour, not a state of matter. And we call fluid movement of air wind. 
So how do we know that wind was depositing our sediments? Well, we've got a couple of bits of evidence. So firstly, the grains that this rock is made out of are all very spherical and they're all the same size, medium to fine grains of quartz. And that means they've been repeatedly worked and sorted and processed over and over and over again. Secondly, they've got frosty pitted surfaces because they've been sandblasted and that's not something that can happen in water. And secondly, there's the scale of them. They're metre scale, they're huge, they're bigger than me. And you don't normally get cross bedded structures this size in flowing water on land like rivers. So these must have been formed and piled up by wind. And so you've probably figured out at this point that these are sand dunes. These are desert sand dunes. So we know now that in the Permian, Arran was covered by high deserts and we had these big dune seas. And that's because far to the south, the southern continent of Gondwana had collided with the northern continent, Laurusia, forming the supercontinent Pangaea and moving the UK north of the equator into the arid latitudes. And we know that the interior areas of Pangaea were deserts because we find these desert deposits all over the world. This desert was huge. It stretched all the way from the UK across Europe and all the way across North America as well. It must have been vast, vast desert. And then between the two continents, you had the Variscan mountain range. And on the other side of that, you had a huge southern desert as well. And so in the Permian, Earth pretty much looked like Tatooine from the Star Wars. And it was inhabited by some pretty weird creatures as well. Go and have a look at uh, some Gorgonopsids, for example. And here's our last stop for the day, still in the Permian. We've got this thing here that looks like a, a little star-shaped crater. Or, if you're of the mind, a cat's arse. <laughs> We've traversed hundreds of millions of years of Earth history along this coastline and we've talked about processes that take millions or hundreds of millions of years but here's a geological process that took a fraction of a second. This is a fulgurite, it's a fossilised lightning strike. Lightning hit the desert sand, fused all of the quartz into glass and left this imprint behind and if you dug it out there would literally be a three-dimensional fossilised lightning bolt in there and they look really, really cool. So there we go, that's our first day on Arran, the Corrie Shore. And we've still got more locations on Arran to look at and some more fantastic geology. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on them. As ever, if you've got any questions or comments or you've seen some cool rocks lately, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, thanks for watching, take care and I'll see you next time. Bye bye! <laughs> I'm such a doofus. Doofus rock.